Nej, det är ju inte barn. Det är ju inte samt jag. Nej, det är ju inte. Good afternoon, comrades. Good afternoon, comrades, and welcome back to this afternoon's session, the second session of the conference. I hope you all had a great lunch. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. A few comrades have lost their bags, so if you do have a bag that doesn't belong to you, um, please can you bring it to the front and just place it um, in the corner there, and we'll sh ensure that it gets to the rightful owner. Thank you. My name's Arkende Membe Chundama from the Socialist Party of Zambia, and I'll be your chair this afternoon. <laughs> this afternoon's panel is Building Socialism Today. We will delve into why socialism is an urgent, legitimate, and possible alternative to capitalism. Our panelists will share concrete experiences, offering valuable insights into the challenges, obstacles, victories, and possibilities in the ongoing construction of socialism. Our first speaker is Danielle Hadway, the mayor of the municipality of Recoleta in Santiago, Chile, and a militant of the Communist Party of Chile. Gracias, compañero. Bien, compañeros, compañeras, muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Quiero partir eh, trayendo, agradeciendo primero la invitación a estar en este panel que me parece de la mayor importancia which I think is very important and at the same time I want to bring to all of you um, uh, a hello from uh, the Communist Party of Chile wishing all of you success in these uh, works um, that are illuminating the future I will present myself first of all only to say that what I say is only valid from my perspective. I am Chilean, but I have uh, Palestinian origins. My family lives uh, for decades, has lived in Chile. But what is happening today is something that I cannot keep silent about. After this ultimatum for Palestinians to get out of, Palest of Gaza, a lot of Palestinians decided to do so. And the response from the Israelis was to uh, bomb the convoy and 200 people died without being able to defend themselves. I say this because the criminals are always going to do their job and will always do the same thing. We cannot expect them to change. And as others have said, we cannot, we cannot um, have any confidence in them. I come from Chile. In Chile, we, we also live times of defeat and hopelessness. But to say that the, the failure of the plebiscite generated a situation and gave us a very hard hit to all of us that are part of the left in Chile. And I say this because we did everything. We, we got up on 18 October, and we put in checkmate the, the neoliberal system in Chile, um, which is the, the result of a coup, a 50-year coup. We achieved that the, the Constitution to write a new Constitution. It, would not, it was not what we wanted. We wanted a, a Constituent Assembly. 
but it was elected by the people. And I want to tell all of you that we wrote and that, co that constitution was the most ecologically sound, the most feminist, the most respectful of the workers and the, the people. And after all that wonderful work, it was rejected by an overwhelming majority of the Chilean people. The reasons are multiple, and I will not go over all of them in detail. The control of the media by the right, the, the asymmetry of the resources, and the leadership of the left parties can only account for one part of it. And I want to tell all of you that today I have heard uh, a bit of the same in the sense that we are all uh, used to talking about the problems of capitalism and what neoliberalism does to us as a people. And I am absolutely convinced that socialism is not a possibility. It is the only possibility. But we have to look. We cannot, we cannot criticize neoliberalism uh, for doing its job. We cannot continue to cry because neoliberalism does what it's supposed to do, to defend its own interests. What we lack, I think, because we, can't, we don't forget, today, today they are attacking Gaza, but they have done so for the past 14 years. And we are living 50 years of the coup in Chile. Three years of the coup in Bolivia, the coup in Peru, 14 of the coup in, in the coup in Venezuela also. All the coups in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, all Latin America, Paraguay. How many years of the, of the Iraq war, the destruction of Libya, the invasion of Syria and the destruction of Syria? I, I don't know why we are still surprised and why we keep um, complaining about it. We have talked too much about what capitalism is doing and how it has put uh, the world in a crisis, ecological crisis, social crisis, political crisis, and economic. But what we seldom talk about is about the responsibility that we all have, the left the many left-wing movements across the world. Socialism is a horizon that is necessary, but the, ones, but the ones that threaten the possibility of socialism is often the left, because socialism has permeated culturally all our people. I will give four details, four great details, but that we have to explore. Someone can say that the lack of unity in the left um, in front of neoliberalism is not the main weakness in all the countries in the world, in, including Palestine, including in Latin America, in Venezuela. Venezuela maybe is the one exempt. But today in Bolivia, today in Argentina, today in Europe, there are more left parties than the, the percentage that we get in every election. Uh, we can laugh about it, but it's sad. But let's imagine that there are, there are countries that, where there are four socialist parties. So neoliberalism, neoliberalism has won so, uh, so much uh, on the left that we have lost the Leninist possibility of overcoming our differences and remaining unified. So today, the challenge for the left that are are still struggling. We are fighting amongst ourselves. It's easier to find the enemies within the same left than on the right. And that is not a problem of neoliberalism. That is our problem. But comrades, how many times have we governed, uh, in quotes, uh, some of the movements on the left in the last 40 years? 
many times, and we have never been able to transform, we have never been able to advance to the horizon of socialism after the collapse of the, so the Soviet Union. We have, tried, we have tried to humanize capitalism, to improve workers' rights, to humanize something that is impossible to humanize. The center left and the center right have been uh, in command. And because the left doesn't do its job, the ultra-right uh, advances. Because capitalism has always done the same thing. The point, the point is expansion. It lets the bourgeois democracy function because since, it, since it's winning, it doesn't care. So that bourgeois democracy, the, the left movements start developing, developing power and get close to the government, to power. But the center left, the supposed progressive left, there come the coups, the dictatorships, or war, which is a mechanism to activate the, the economy of the military industrial complex in the world. And that today, until this day, we seem to not understand the logic of capitalism that has been overwhelming us for centuries and doesn't allow us to change. Uh, we have we have left movements that that are uh, NATO pro NATO. We have uh, left movements that are pro Putin. We have left movements that recognize the rights of Israel. Look at the decla declarations, the the disgusting declarations of these movements. There is not one that can condemn Israel. But, but today, I am atheist, so I don't believe in any fundamental in religious fundamentalism. I don't believe in the chosen, uh, in the promised land. I don't believe that war can be holy, but in effect, these are instruments of domination that have divided us. But on top of that, but when I don't know if you know, but when fascism commits crimes, there is no consequence. But when we do, there are. We, ne we never occupy justice in order to make uh, the right pay for the crimes, because justice in a bourgeois democracy is an instrument of domination. And in Latin America, we are seeing that. And if that wasn't enough, the left has over-institutionalized itself more and more closely to the structures of capitalism, and they have gone further away from the masses. And yes, we've gotten to the governments and the parliaments, but we are not where people live. And I remind folks that communists should never seek a vote. They should tirelessly work to better the conditions and the material conditions of those that are around them. If that brings you to the vote, that's perfect. But we have become an electoral left that is seeking, that has not changed the reality of the base. And we have strayed further away from the concrete horizon. Why would we continue to lie to ourselves? It is, this, this conference has a, a wonderful name, Dilemmas of Humanity, uh, Building Socialism Today. When was the last time that we don't speak with pride about socialism and argue about the past? Chile has had to recognize the past, to re reckon with the past, to recognize the future. They said that a coup occurred because it was a bad government. And when you look at the numbers, you can see that it was the best government in the history of Chile, and the, and the best public policies that were implemented were Allende's. No one can say that Allende was toppled because of poor governance. 
Prior to Allende coming into power, the plan was already set for him. What, what is left for us to understand? We need to reckon with the past, to reckon with the future. I am part of a party that has a, over 111 years of history. Imagine how hard that is to, to, to reckon and, and to be a militant in a, in a party that has been around for for 111 years in a, in a system of capitalism, of planned obsolescence, which encourages us to switch our phones every every year, our, our cars every two years, and, and is always developing us to consume and to develop an irrational love for the new and looking for, for new pathways, new, new pathways, comrades. Technology takes up more of our time instead of the time that it takes to dialogue and hold those decision-making powers accountable. And we have strayed away from our people. And we that should convince us that our first task as a left that wants to build socialism, right, because there are not all, so many have, you know, given up. You know, they, that's that's the that's what capitalism is. That they want us to to be defeated. But the first task of the left that wants to build socialism is to uh, look inward and look critically and to overcome our own fallacies. We need to stop crying over capitalism working as it's intended to. We need to look inward and, and look at our lack of unity, our lack of conviction. Have, have you set, thought to consider that the Soviet Union is only known as, as, as something, ne the negative things that have occurred within it and not the positive contributions that they have made for the world? Marx, think proletarians of the world unite. It's not some electoral slogan. It comes from the idea of, of, alien, of alienation, that the, the, everything that exists outside of the, the body, the organic body, is, is, the, is the inorganic body. And all of the struggle that is waged in solidarity is, is, is not happening because it's it's taking place in a body outside of our own because but we cannot disassociate you know this is this is the these are the philosophical teachings that we need to recenter ourselves on we need to bring our ways of thinking to the base and i say all of this and i don't want to to appear petulant or, or petty you know i i come from the most neoliberal country in the world in Chile, where 20 years ago, in a small city of 220,000 inhabitants, uh, the Communist Party of Chile only had 2% of the vote, and we had nothing. 20 years later, we have 65% of the vote, and we control two-thirds of the municipalities in a completely adverse environment on every front, politically, with all of, all of the uh, media against us. But the, the ideological conviction, the, the work of building our base, managing the political superstructure and in direct contact and communication with the people that we say we represent. With all of this, I want to say that socialism is the only alternative. We have developed from a local government, from a municipality, and we have implemented measures to improve the lives of our proletariat that lives there, you know, with popular pharmacies, popular culture, popular bookstores, classes that cost less than 10% of what they cost in the market. But the most relevant thing is, is that we have changed the culture of our people. And when the whole country advances towards the right, Recoleta, we have communism advancing, simply, simply put. If Recoleta can do it, we can do that in any part of the world, but we need to be capable of looking at ourselves and, and recognizing that the unity of people needs to part from unity in the left, because if the left does not unite and they are incapable of looking beyond personal interests, beyond personal projects, if they are not capable of pulling all of those 
personal interest to center the struggle for the construction of, of socialism without protagonism. We are about to lose Ecuador. We are about to lose Bolivia in Latin America. We are about to lose Argentina. If God exists, I hope that I'm wrong and that he wants the opposite. But everything is because we are not doing our work. Right? And so I want to say if we continue to behave the same way as a, as a global left, you know, from, 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 the, from Palestine to Sahara to Latin America to Europe, well, why talk about Europe if they have more communist parties than communists? We will continue to yield the same results. And the issue is that we all say that we, that we feel that we are the arbiters of truth, which is the furthest thing from the construction of socialism that puts forward dialectics. And if we do not look at things in a materialist lens, you, we are full of a left that spews absolute truth, and we will not be able to advance at a left. And I look at our Palestinian people and, and those that were part of the Popular Front, where that I, you know, was a militant since I was 11, and all of those that were militants in the Asaika front and those who, who changed their names that stopped calling themselves communists in the 90s because they fell into the trap of renouncing the strategic project. It's not, it's not a Hamas thing, no, because nowadays folks are being called fundamentalists. It is because the, that amalgamation of people offers an alterna a radical alternative instead of other leftist parties. And, and as a left, we are not reaching the people that is capable of making those changes. I want to thank you all for your patience in listening to me. And I hope that we can come together once again in a different context because we are not just looking to defeat neoliberalism. We are looking to overcome ourselves. Thank you. Viva socialism! Viva, Viva socialism! Viva. Thank you very much, Danielle. Our next speaker is Tings Chuck, uh, an internationalist artist, writer, and organizer who serves as an editor of Dongsheng News in Shanghai and leads the art department of Tricontinental Institute of Social Research. Thank you, thank you. Hello, comrades. It's good to be home in South Africa. I want to thank the <laughs> comrades of South Africa from NUMSA, Abaslali Basum Jondolo, uh, SRWP, Pan Africanism Today, and all the comrades of the Dilemmas of Humanity process. It's really good to be home. So, I have a great uh, task of talking about the building of socialism from the perspective of China. I guess I was thinking in preparing for this that I think sometimes socialists, we, who, those of us who call ourselves socialists, who are fighting for socialism, um, are a little bit impatient about the process of building socialism. Um, we have a lot of ideas about what socialism looks like. We have a lot of books and pamphlets and speeches like I'm about to give you. <laughs> but we are very quick to judge the living practices and experiments of real breathing socialist projects. So I think it's very important for us at the Dilemmas of Humanity Conference to, because we're here to move beyond the realm of ideas and really think about these concrete actions and practice and, and a pathway towards socialism. And so with that, we have to look at socialism as a historical process and as historical experiments. But what is socialism? I mean, is it an idea? Is it a, a thing? Can you hold it? Is it a place? When do we get there? And when do we know we've arrived? I mean, in the Communist Manifesto, we go to our great uncles, Marx and Engels, who told us that, you know, we have to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie. But they really didn't tell us how we were 
to go about doing this. And in the critique of the Gotha program, Marx told us how this, this socialism is a transitional phase of this society emerging from the womb of the old society, but how long is this transitional phase? So in China, we had a socialist revolution in 1949, and this ongoing history of building socialism has gone through many stages, many zigs and zags, and uh, Vijay always likes to quote Lenin on that, many advances, many setbacks, many lessons, many trials and errors. So in my brief time today, I'll try to talk about the building of socialism in China with the historical lens, particularly looking at how China has been trying to confront these dilemmas of humanity of our time, such as poverty, such as inequality, and this building of a path to socialist modernization for a country so big. And ultimately, because socialism isn't just about the past or present, it's about our future, a socialist future. And so to actually better understand the debates and processes about uh, development of socialism in China, we at Dongsheng and the Tricontinental have been working with a magazine called Wanhua Zhonghang. And on our second issue, we were talking about this very question. How do we frame China's advances, particularly around the combat against poverty in this question of socialist modernization, socialist construction? And I would like to frame it in more or less four distinct phases of this experimentation in China. And it takes us back all the way before the PRC was formed, founded. It takes us back 100 years ago to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s when the communist movement was beginning to build uh, revolutionary base areas. The first being in Jiangxi in the south of the country where we had the first Chinese Soviet and this was the place after four years of experimentation that we had to strategically retreat uh, and uh, set on lo Long March. Of course, all the comrades know about the Long March here. And arriving after a year, tired, exhausted, and very few, the communists set up again in Yan'an to create a new base, to start again, start again these processes of experimentation with land reform, with governance, with socialist cultural programs, literacy programs, education programs that were urgently needed by the people. And in the process, building up the communist movement and the support for the party. And so it was from this period that the party actually learns about the importance of addressing these dilemmas of hunger, of poverty, facing the people as inseparable from building socialist power. So by the time the PRC is founded in 1949, the CPC had already two decades of socialist governance experimentation uh, in base areas covering 100 million people. So the Mao period in the, the second phase after seizing of state power uh, builds on these experiences. Uh, and in this period of about 30 years, we see the transference, the seizing of the means for production from the private hands into the public hands um, and ensuring that the land is given to the tillers for those who toil on the land. And in this period, China achieved basic industrialization, huge social gains, but economically, the country, after 30 years of a socialist process, was still extremely poor. And the vast majority of Chinese people lived in extreme poverty. And so in this third phase of socialist construction, facing the situation, Deng Xiaoping famously said, poverty is not socialism. Socialism is to eliminate poverty. And he attempted to chart a new course to address the country's need to modernize and the people's need for a better life. And so remember, at the end decades of the 20th century, globally, the socialist movement was waning. Uh, the Soviet Union was collapsing, and we were entering this period of the so-called end of history. So China's socialist system also was forced to undergo a self-transformation through what we call the opening up and reform period. And this required reintroducing private capital in certain sectors of society, the integration of China into the international system 
so that we could rapidly de develop our productive forces to learn from the West, the technology, the knowledge, so that we could strategically prioritize the industrialization of certain regions. And so this is when we see experiments like special economic zones in Shenzhen being created and being experimented with. At the time, observers, I would say across the political spectrum, um, interpret this new direction as the death knell of the socialist project in China, as proof that China had gone down a capitalist path. But I, I think that these initial assessments by both outside and inside the country lack the necessary information, the historical distance, and the historical patience to evaluate what was the socialist character of China's reforms. So at the end of 2022, uh, just over four decades of these impressive reforms that Deng began, China made an impressive announcement that it had eradicated extreme poverty in a country of 1.4 billion people. And to put this in perspective, that's 850 million people that extre exited extreme poverty since 1978. That would be almost the whole continent of Africa. Um, this represents 76% of the global reduction of poverty. That means every three out of four people who are lifted out of extreme poverty in the world were lifted inside China. And we have to think where China began. In 1949, we were the 11th poorest country in the world in terms of per capita GDP. Eight countries in Africa and two countries in Asia were poorer than China. And now it is the second, or depending how you measure with purchasing parity, we are the largest economy in the world. So this isn't just a historic ch uh, feat for the Chinese people. It is very much a feat for the world, for humanity, and for the forces of the left. But how do we understand and assess the stage that China's building of socialism is today? You know, can we credit to socialism? Do we credit to the market reforms? And how do we assess this period, which I would call the fourth period of socialist construction under the leadership of President Xi Jinping? And I want to use some of his own words. Um, in November of last year, the CPC had its 20th National Congress. And in this, uh, she gave a report to assess, critically assess, the country and the party's own work so far. And I'll quote him and what he said. He said, a decade ago, Chinese people made great achievements and had that had been secured in the reform, opening up, and socialist modernization. At the same time, however, a number of prominent issues and problems emerged. Some that had been, been building for years and others which were just emerging that demanded urgent action. And then he went on to say that the country had lost confidence in socialism, that there was money worship, that there was watered down leadership in the party, that the development in some instances had followed an imbalanced, uncoordinated and unsustainable path these are heavy self-criticisms by a leader of a country that had been leading the country for 10 years. And the CPC itself identifies the principal contradiction of this phase of socialist construction as that no longer of the opening and reform period of Deng, which is to develop rapidly the productive forces. We did that for 40 years. Now it's shifted to addressing the unbalanced and inadequate development of the country. And in Xi's own words, the thing that he spent the most time with in the last 10 years is combating poverty. And it's through the combating of poverty that these questions of addressing unbalanced and inadequate development that was produced in the reform period are being addressed. So um, I'll just mention very briefly, in the Tricontinental, we did do a study. We had a chance to go to the countryside, to talk to party cadre, to talk to peasants, to women, to youth about this campaign to eradicate extreme poverty. And I'll just explain more or less five key takeaways, and I invite everyone to have a chance to look at that deeper study. And the first is that China didn't use a cash transfer mechanism. It approached it by a multi-dimensional method. Of course, income is an important metric, but had to also guarantee the assurances of food and clothing, and also the importance of basic health care, basic and free education, and also 
healthy, uh, the housing that is secure with electricity and running water. This was the metrics that China used to consider the eradication of extreme poverty. The second is looking at the capacity to mobilize the party itself. The Chinese Communist Party is huge. It's 98 million people. It would be the 16th most populous country if it was a country. So mobilize the party sent three million members to go to the countryside to live there for years at a time until every single household was lifted out of extreme poverty. And a third is that the party alone can't do this achievement. Remember, the, the country is under the guidance of the CPC. The CPC has to mobilize the whole of society. That's the private sector. That's the civil sector. That's the teachers, the professors, the doctors, the students into uh, at this process of eliminating extreme poverty. So this mobilization of the whole society was integral in this campaign. The fourth, and we can't so underestimate this, is the, how the people, the poor, the peasants themselves were the protagonists in lifting themselves out of poverty. This wasn't just a handout from the government. This was about peasants realizing in this stage of socialist construction that they were agents in lifting themselves out of poverty and eradicating extreme poverty in the country. And the final thing that I think is very important for those of us in this room who are part of social movements and political organizations is how much this campaign was part of the party's effort to reconnect with the grassroots. And in our words, and in, in, the, in the, line, the words of Mao would be uh, reestablishing the mass line, which we know for many years in the reform period, one of the costs of the reform period was a weakening, a detachment of the party from the very grassroots. So I want to talk about one woman I had a chance to meet who was a grandmother of 98 years old. Uh, she was someone who lived through, in some ways, this four periods of socialist transformation, this dec 100 years of, of, of socialist construction. She was born in 1935. And when she was born, she was expected to live for 35 years. That was the average life expectancy in China. She was probably going to be wedded off as a child, uh, growing up her whole life illiterate, uh, she became a teenager during the Japanese occupation, which in China lasted 14 years and took the lives of 20 million Chinese people. And, and she entered her, 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 her sort of adulthood uh, as the PRC was being formed. And in her lifetime, she saw the transformations. The house where I met her in was actually a product of the revolution. It used to be a house owned by landlords. In the 1970s, during the Cultural Revolution, it was taken from the landlords and redistributed to three poor peasant families. In the most recent period, uh, in the poverty alleviation campaign under Xi Jinping, there was a new grapefruit factory that was established in her village as one of the methods to uh, in incentivize productive capacity. And so now she receives a supplementary income from the dividends of this, of this company because she leases her part of her land that she was unproductive previously. So these are just one of the small examples. And I met with her along with the party cadre uh, who was among the three million people sent. And he visits her frequently. Uh, he oversaw the uh, reforms in her house, the renovations in her house. Uh, there's now a solar panel heating system. There's now 4G internet. Because part of the process is also making sure every rural household is also connected to the rest of the country through highways, high-speed railways, through the internet. As Lenin said, communism is Soviet power and the electrification of the country. And there are literally 100 million stories of this type I don't have time to share that led to this successful campaign to eradicate extreme poverty and marks this, what China calls the first centenary goal. Imagine you have a goal for a century, uh, which marks the 100th year of the founding of the CPC. But of course, Ending extreme poverty is not our end solution. It's not the goal, it's not the arrival point. It's just the minimum program to building a socialist and a modern society. So China now is in the process of building the second centenary goal, which is to build a modern socialist society by 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the PRC. And I would say this struggle to understand modernization from a socialist lens, not just what the capitalist West 
has said, has had hegemony over the idea of modernization. Now we're also struggling, as with the concept of socialism, to define modernization and rest this concept from the West. And it's also an ideological battle of our time. And since 1949, it's been a process of understanding what another path for modernization under socialism can look like. And I would say I could talk about the many, many paths and many, uh, many sectors that this modernization is being waged. I mean, in terms of technology, and I know we'll have sections about technology, but you know, in 1949, China couldn't produce a car. 20 years later, China launched the first satellite in space. And now China is contesting some of the most advanced sectors of technology. And the West is not happy with that. The West was really happy when Chinese workers, when we remain cheap, exploitable labor to produce that the goods that the West wanted. But the moment that you know the workers wanted the iPhones that we produced, or wanted to maybe have the audacity to build alternatives or even better technologies, the West was not okay with this. Huawei is a prime example. The lawfare, economic warfare, the media warfare that was launched by the US to crush one company, one Chinese tech company, and try to choke off the Chinese tech industry from the essential chips. And I think it's quite coincidental, maybe ironic, and to the, that to the surprise of the world, when the US Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, was visiting China recently, uh, who was one of the people responsible for placing the sanctions on China in the first place, Huawei quietly launched the Mate 60 Pro cell phone, first 5G cell phone. And you know, those these Western experts try to open up the phone, they try to dig all the component parts. Is there something we can sanction in this phone? Something else we can sanction? But they couldn't find anything. Because China, even to the surprise of many Chinese people, we were able, we were forced by the sanctions, we were forced by the new Cold War to develop our own productive capacity today in this new technological battle to produce the seven nanometer um, chip that we didn't have access to to actually produce hundreds of component parts now that are Chinese made in that cell phone that wasn't before. And so maybe it's not a surprise that when President Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela came, he was also gifted this cell phone, you know, uh, a comradely country that is also highly sanctioned, another socialist country that is trying to find its own path to develop socialism. So he left very happy with his Huawei phone. So I want to end and with one story and I had a recent chance to, to go with some comrades to Ganan, which is where the Jiangxi, in Jiangxi province, where the first Soviet was built. Because we are now thinking about what is the next stage of modernization in the countryside? How do we address the core questions of the sustainability of rural economic development, the vibrancy of rural life? How do we ensure that there's a renewed socialist solution to the agrarian question today? Where are the excesses of capital? Where does the party need to reinsert itself? And a lot of this is happening in the countryside. So I went to Ganan, uh, and you know, for many people, um, when the communists left uh, for the long march, including Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and Zhu De, they actually never went back to the Jiangxi Soviet because it was so hard to access. The roads were so poor, the conditions were so bad. In fact, this old revolutionary era area was, remained impoverished for a very long time, until recent years. Even though it is less than 500 kilometers away from Shenzhen, this mega city that's now home to huge tech companies like Huawei. So Ganan represents that uneven development that she talked about, that the party is very conscious of, that was a product of the reform period. So now, in the recent years, uh, the Chinese government is creating this targeted support of Ganan and other old revolutionary areas, and pairing them with places like Shenzhen. So Shenzhen, the symbol of the opening up, revolution, uh, opening up reform area, is now paired with Ganan, the site of the first uh, Chinese Soviet. To do what? To engage in the rural revitalization experiments, to develop infrastructure, to improve in local governance, like training a lot of the leaders and party secretaries of Ganan in Shenzhen and to make economic links directly from agricultural producers to Shenzhen. And some of you might know this famous quote that's misquoted by Deng, Deng Xiaoping, to say, the opening up and reform is to let a few get rich. 
But I think what the West interpreted this really maliciously, really, is they didn't quote the whole thing he said. He said, let a few, though, a few get rich so that those who get rich have a responsibility to bring others along. And this second part of the statement, to bring others along, is what we're seeing today in this stage of socialist construction, like we're seeing in the cooperation between Shenzhen and Ganan. Um, and this is also important because the places that benefited from the opening up reform have a revolutionary responsibility to support the regions that made the Chinese revolution possible. In Ganan today, every single family has a direct link to the first generation communists that went on that long march. This is a historical duty, it's a revolutionary duty. So in this, I'll just wrap up my words. I think we are here to discuss the building of socialism. Um, I think for many of us, from the Global South countries, this process of finding our independent path towards modernization that isn't captured by the capitalist West is still part of our national liber liberation struggle. It has not been completed yet. And for us who are trying to chart a path from people's movements, social movements, political parties, what is our centenary goal? What is our hundred year plan for building socialism? We know that we're not building socialism. One thing we can learn from the Chinese experience, it's not for our generation only. It's for the next generation and the generations after that. So comrades, what does our long march look like? What is the socialist future that we're aiming to build together for the generations to come? Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Comrade Tings. I think the comrades will agree with me that Comrade Tings has achieved a very, very difficult task of summarizing the building of socialism in China in 20 minutes. And I think you did a very good job, comrade. Um, just to let everybody know, the study that Comrade Tings referred to is actually available at the Tricontinental Desk up in the old fort. So I'm not sure if they have enough copies to go around. Oh, there's plenty copies. So please rush there still so that you stu still do get a copy of um, the study. It's called um, Serve the People, and it's available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Our next speaker is Carmen Neves Reyes, the Executive Director of the Simon Bolivar Institute in Caracas, Venezuela, and she's a Bolivarian revolutionary and feminist. Thank you, comrades. Comrades, you have left me with a great responsibility. I did not expect to talk in this conference of dilemmas of humanity, uh, at least not in public. 
But here we are, and we are answering the call for Chavez. Without him, I would not be here. And I would not be here because a Venezuelan woman, a black Venezuelan woman, here talking about socialism is almost a miracle. And a miracle for a lot of reasons. But <laughs> I will tell you about them shortly. First, I want to say hi to all of you and thank, thank you for the invitation. And I want to uh, ask permission to talk to, the, to my comrades in the front, the people who should be here, the people of the Popular Front from the Union Comunera, Comunera in Venezuela. So once the Popular Power, Poder Popular, uh, has given me the word, I will start. Uh, a lot of people say that <laughs> say that uh, Venezuelans start in the, in 89 to talk about socialism, uh, the proposal for Bolivarian socialism, because in the in 89 the Venezuelan population uh, rebelled against against the model proposed, the ca the savage capitalism model proposed. Uh, in 89, Venezuela came to uh, uh, um, close the chapter on that history. And the, the president at the time had already signed the contract with the IMF to advance the, all the proposals of the savage neoliberalism. But in spite of that, in February of 89, the people of Venezuela broke, uh, rose up in Caracas and very, various cities in Venezuela where the majority of the population said, we do not want, we do not want privatization. We do not want Venezuelan properties, uh, Venezuelan oil to be privatized. And so we are not talking about now of a population, of a people, that already had a project in mind, a delineated project, but a population of people that was rebelling in, uh, against neoliberalism and savage capitalism. And for us, that is already a miracle because the Venezuelan people uh, were not talking about socialism. The proposal of the left in Venezuela had been defeated in the 70s and the 60s. So the Venezuelan people did not talk at that time about socialism. We highlight this because 30 years later, thanks to Chavez coming to power, I'm jumping from 89 to 2000 to the 2000s, what I want to highlight is that the Venezuelan people were not talking about socialism in 89. They were not talking about uh, a left that had been defeated. 30 years later, thank you, thanks to Commander Chavez, to talk about a, a Venezuelan proposal. So we are not talking about uh, a theoretical tradition the known history of that time. But Venezuela dared to make proposals. And these proposals uh, begin with rescuing our history. So uh, a military man with the profile, with that profile, that anyone could, uh, we were accused of having a new Pinochet, tried to talk about what uh, Venezuelan socialism would look like, rescuing historical figures and historical processes that had been considered uh, passé, already defeated. And he started saying that the first thing that we have, that Venezuelan socialism has to do is to rescue its roots, because Venezuelan roots contain uh, proposals that can be easily identified and assimilated 
to the European socialism and, and he rescued Bolívar, Zamora, Bolívar because of the, the theme of sovereignty, the right of the peoples to have control over their own history, popular power, and Zamora because of his idea of what is an agrarian reform, the land and the power of men and women. It could seem that this is um, merely a historical issue of rescuing history, but Chavez went further, and he made a series of proposals that he later started constructing little by little. It's not a linear, linear process. There are no recipes for this. We have had to forge this path that is this path that is very difficult, and a lot of times we have had to retreat. However, so, in talking about this construction of this Venezuelan socialism, we call it Venezuelan because whoever has been in Venezuela knows that it's not easy. It's not easy to explain. We don't have a recipe, not even for our own, for for ourselves. So we don't have a recipe of how to build socialism for all of you. In the Venezuelan case, there have been a series of proposals. The first one is to rescue the power of the Venezuelan state in order to have an advance in the control of our resources, because Venezuela is a country with oil, rich in oil. Its economy was built um, around oil. Its economy was constructed around oil, an economy of perfect complementarity, not with the th South, but with the North, with the U.S. All our oil went to the U.S., and everything that Venezuelans wanted to consume came from the North, not only raw materials, food, but culture and the uh, and world views so this proposal this is how it looked like in venezuela to retake control of our main product which is oil so oil would be used for two things first to have to have a means a tool an instrument to be able to negotiate with the north because we were the main exporter of oil for them, but then use it as a tool to cooperate with the South, to share the wealth produced by our oil. Simply, oil used to be, um, the wealth from oil used to be, uh, used to go to an, a party of the elite, distributed among two major parties. Within that development, of Venezuelan socialism, Chavez made a call of what we know now as popular power, poder popular. We sometimes use the generic term of uh, pueblo, a people, but we know that that term has to be defined as a power that is transformed, a power that is used to transform the state, the communes, that power comes from the communes, from the popular movements, from the basis of the party, because in the Venezuelan case, the Socialist Party of Venezuela is always seen in a lot of cases as a part of power. So we're talking about a power that is divided in between in four, not always aligned those parts. So the party 
es un gran, una gran pata que, que puede is a, eh, is a big part that can that can cause uh, disequilibrium but in the case of Venezuela that party has has been used to sustain ourselves that equilibrium has been very hard to come by we talk about instances of power in the case of Venezuela and in many ways in organizations and in, in the communes they are uh, creating power uh, amongst uh, throughout the country and uh, Daniel as they expressed you know the cases the case is not is not simple there is not a, a shared understanding of this model in all instances in all conceptualizations of it but it is important to highlight that in the case of the majority of those that take on uh, political responsibilities uh, that it is through this model that we will continue to advance uh, to through uh, Bolivarian socialism. And what have we proposed? One of the things that is always spoken about in the Venezuelan case is uh, popular organization, base building, community organizing. It is not work that in all cases is not easy. It is work that many times uh, brings the majority of folks that are participating in these processes uh, a lot of work, uh, an arduous work journey. And it is work that we know is necessary uh, to sustain and advance Bolivarian socialism. And so base building is is where we have galvanized much support from and the participation of folks in Venezuela. There are always uh, brigades of folks that are helping us in our processes because we also need to understand that Venezuelans don't know everything, that our process is uh, is not perfect and we need to uh, learn from other folks outside and we understand that part of our principles is international uh, internationalism right so we have you know Bolivar Caloidas Ramirez are internationalists and we reclaim those histories as such and so base building is in various parts of the country and once again I reiterate with uh, the support of many of our comrades even many that are here including uh, the MST from Brazil uh, Patria Grande from Argentina we have some comrades from the Basque region and Venezuela for a long time and continues to receive support in order to continue uh, building a pathway to socialism. We also think in the building of the pathway of Venezuelan socialism, we're, we're talking about building a path well, that actually, as you know, in, in 2005, uh, Chavez decreed the Bolivarian socialism. We need to build it. I can't just decree that it, that it exists and we need to take steps towards it. And in our case, the, in the Venezuelan experience, what speaks the most is, is the fact that we need to return power to the people. It is that popular people power that really is the foundation to building socialism. And that socialism is not just political, as we've seen, because in all of the years of the revolution, uh, that have maintained uh, people power has been the ability to to exercise a popular vote and I think that our our, our, our greatest challenge is the control of the means of production, uh, building a sovereign economy that can respond to what up until this point has been 
our our biggest Achilles heel, which is the being unable to have a robust economy that does not depend on oil, on petroleum, right? And I and I, it's it's kind of a joke, right? We we say that we we say thank you to the, to those sanctions, right? Uh, because thanks to them, Venezuela has has had to be inventive to find new means of income, uh, new new streams of income, and we and this is important, right? The, these communal economies that are taking place in the different territories of Venezuela, and as Comandante Chavez said. It is a miracle that, this, that despite being unable to swim, we have no idea how we do it. And so the Venezuelan people that are organizing those communes, that are doing work uh, by the cooperatives, uh, growing their own crops, is, is, a, is key to Bolivarian socialism in this current moment. And it is to say that the Venezuelan economy is transforming itself thanks to some key uh, factors that that we had not yet identified or were not clear about, right, uh, in, in implementing the theory behind the model. Those people that are doing this work and that contribute to, to the state, right, we, we do need to recognize that they're the ones that contribute to the state. They are the ones that have achieved from the year 2019-2018 to, to take qualitative steps towards the Venezuelan model. And this is extremely important for us because up until this point, we had not had a means to, to advance the state economy. And so when we advance the Bolivarian state, we are saying that we have an opportunity uh, because of popular power, because of the institutions, because of the organization and the efforts of our comrades that are in the various territories that have been able to talk about what Bolivar said, right? That the government can provide the, the maximum uh, possibility of happiness. And this is how we build uh, Bolivarian socialism. The, we, we want to build the, the maximum potential of happiness, of, of safety, of political stability, even when the, uh, political stability in in Venezuela is at risk. I don't have anything else to add other than these are really big ideas or f and frameworks, right? And to, to provoke uh, dialogue, to, to give our comrades who are in the territories new proposals. We are, we are always building. We are under construction. This is, this is a process that we are building towards daily, right? Uh, building that third rule, right? To, to, to invent or cease to exist, right? The construction of socialism. Venezuelan style are, uh, puts forth some proposals that may be interesting to all of us, uh, and we are seeking, but we are not seeking to, to cook a perfect recipe, right? And so I think I'll leave that there. I thank all of you for taking the time to listen. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, comrade. Our last speaker is Vijay Prashad. He is the director of Tricontinental Institute of Social Research, the chief correspondent for Globetrotter, and the chief editor of Leftward Books in New Delhi, India. Zindabad! Zindabad! Comrades, I miss my friends a lot. And I want to start with that. I miss Dr. Heather Eath, a South African Palestinian. I'm editing his book for Leftward Books. It's called Decolonizing the Palestinian Mind. 
His apartment was bombed three days ago. He has two young children. Dr. Heather Eid cannot leave Gaza. He cannot sit here in one of those chairs and join us. I miss my friends. I miss my friend of 30 years, Praveer Purkaista. I miss my friend, Amit Chakrabarti. They should be sitting here. Amit Chakrabarti was key for us in building the process of the International People's Assembly in Asia. Probir was key for us, a key intellectual, to help us build the dilemmas of humanity process. I miss my friends. They should be sitting here with us, but they are not here. I miss my friends because with Probir, with whom I argued for years about Lenin, I would always say to Probir, comrade, Lenin said, if you're scared of failure, you won't try. If you're scared of failure, you won't do anything. We try. They may jail us, they may bomb us, but we'll keep trying. We're never going to stop trying. We fight, we win. We fight, we win. We fight to win. We don't just fight to fight. We don't just fight for the sake of fighting. We fight to win. We must win. We have to win. What do we want to win? You see, that's always perplexing for us. We understand the obstinate facts in the world. Obstinate facts. Facts that we can't transcend easily. What are these obstinate facts? Hunger, obstinate fact. Illiteracy, obstinate fact. Homelessness, obstinate fact. We have to transcend them. We fight to transcend the obstinate facts. Transcending those obstinate facts, that's socialism. Socialism is the transcending of the obstinate facts. That's all it is. It's not such a scary word. It's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to transcend the obstinate fact. They've made the word socialism terrifying. Socialists want to take away your house. What house? I don't have a house. I'm with Abakhlali based Majondolo. I don't have a house. I'm seizing the land. They're going to take away your education. What education? They're going to take away your health care. What health care? I'm with the Ricardo Silva Clinic in Recoleta. That's my health care. In fact, recently, Daniel made sure that my health was taken care of by the public system in Recoleta. But they tell you, they're going to take away everything. They're going to take away your clothes. Nobody wants your clothes, comrade. Nobody wants the shirt off your back. Nobody wants the little things that you have in your house. What we want to take away are not your things. We don't want to take away your homes. That's not socialism. We want to seize state power and we want to capture capital. Socialism is about taking the capital in the world and making it ours. You see, many of our movements have decided it's OK to permanently coexist with capitalism. They've forgotten that for our movement, for us, our journey, the socialist tradition, we are fighting for the final aim. We believe in socialism. We're not fighting against capitalism alone. When people say, you are an anti-capitalist, I say, not really. That's not enough for me. I'm a socialist. When they say, oh, you're an anti-imperialist, anti I'm a socialist. Anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, these are stations on the road to socialism. We can't forget the final aim, which is socialism. If a movement starts to believe it can permanently coexist in capitalism. Its culture changes. The culture of the movement will change. You forget that you're fighting to transcend the obstinate facts. We don't want to improve 
the conditions of hunger. We want to abolish hunger. We don't want to make sure people can live in shacks. We want people to live in homes. We don't need charity. We want everything. Socialism is the demand for everything, transcending the obstinate facts. You see, there are barriers for us when we say, well, we want to transcend the obstinate facts. Why can't we do it? Why is it so difficult? Why do they keep jailing us, killing us, going to war against us when we want to establish the transcendence of the obstinate fact? What's their problem? They tell us they believe in equal rights. They tell us through the United Nations that hunger is a bad thing. Hunger is a bad thing. And yet, the world produces twice the amount of food that we need to eat. How is it possible that we produce enough food for 14 billion people and yet 3 billion people struggle to eat? How is that even possible? They'll tell us there's too many people on the planet. That's a lie. That's the battle of ideas. That's a lie. They tell us that people can't eat because they're lazy. That's a lie. People work hard, but they don't earn enough. You see, the reason there are hungry people in the world isn't because there's not enough food. There are hungry people in the world because a lot of people don't have money. And they don't have money because the capitalist system steals their, their labor, steals their effort, and accumulates that money for itself. Look, the problem for us, which we have to transcend, isn't just hunger, but it's private property. Private property is a serious barrier. Let me give you two examples of why this is a barrier. You know, in our institute, we started looking at why is it or how is it possible that so much money sits in illegal tax havens? $37 trillion sits in illegal tax havens. If you take that money, you can solve most of the obstinate facts in the world. That's money stolen from workers and kept in illicit tax havens in offshore accounts. They spent six trillion dollars, Western governments spent six trillion dollars every year subsidizing oil and gas companies. Six trillion dollars. And yet they can't find the money, 100 billion, for the climate fund. 100 billion is nothing compared to six trillion dollars. They spent two trillion dollars on weapons. One trillion spent by the United States alone. Private property is our problem. There's enough wealth on the planet. There's enough technology on the planet for us to start advancing to socialism now. We don't have to wait to build the productive forces. They're built up now. Our biggest barrier isn't technology or wealth. It's that the private property of the bourgeoisie is our barrier. And it blocks the door to social advancement. You see, comrades, I'm going to lay out, because these presentations were so good, four different kinds of socialist practice that we have to practice now, we have to put in place now. The first is relief. We have so many good examples. The first government of Lula da Silva in Brazil, pushed by the landless workers movement and others, was able to almost abolish hunger in Brazil. Even within a bourgeois setup, you can command the forces to provide relief to the people. It is not true that you have to wait for some further stage of history to provide relief to the people. It is objectionable that in our countries, austerity continues to be pounded on the heads of the poor. China has been able to abolish poverty. Relief, the first aspect of socialist construction is relief. And to my mind, because I believe that you can't be a socialist if you're not fundamentally angered by the presence of hunger. There is no possibility. You can't be a theoretical socialist. If you're not angry about the situation of hunger in the world today, you can't be a socialist. You have to be enraged by that. And that's why the demand for relief now is essential. The fight to make sure 
as much as possible. We are able to transcend some obstinate facts now. The first road is a road of relief. The second road is the road of recomposing the key classes. Neoliberalism, capitalism has attacked workers' solidarity, destroyed the culture of solidarity amongst workers. The entire precarious industry, informal work, gig work, alienates workers from each other. They are cut away from the culture of working class solidarity. One of our key tasks is to recompose the culture of the working class, to bring the working class together. There are many instruments to do this. In Kerala, for instance, in India, the building of cooperatives is a remarkable experiment to bring together the working class which had been alienated from each other because of the structures of capitalism. Kudumbushri, for instance, 5.4 million women, 5.4 million women in one cooperative during the pandemic, because their social sense is so high, they switched from making all the other things they were making and started making masks, making uh, uh, sanitizer, and so on. Building or recomposing the collective life of the working class creates a culture of working class solidarity. The workers weren't wo waiting for somebody to tell them to act. They knew to act immediately because their culture of solidarity had been built through the culture of building mass cooperatives, production cooperatives. The process of communas, for instance, Venezuela, is a process of recomposing the class, bringing alienated people together to work together, to build together, and build not only goods and services, but build a culture of solidarity in recomposing themselves as a class. The third element is rescuing the collective life. One of the most remarkable features of capitalism is that it has destroyed our collective sense of a culture. I mean, things are so bad now that people don't really have common reference points, cultural reference points. People are living in their own subcultural zones and so on. And in fact, it's not true that we have to rescue the cultural life only for mobile phones. Because there are some forces that have seized the opportunity to build collective lives for people. I mean right-wing religious forces. I mean forces of, you know, real fascistic elements that bring people together collectively, give them the collective experience. You see, one of the tragedies of the neoliberal period is when social democratic parties became neoliberal. The left had to enter that domain and defend the gains of social democracy. The left had no energy to build the collective life. We were there fighting to defend unions, fighting to defend the gains of the previous generation. But we, what we were not doing was going among the class and building the culture of community and solidarity. We were not going among the people and teaching children music. We were not going among the people holding fairs, community events, giving people a sense of the delight of being alive, the joy of being alive. We allowed the right to do that. So the fourth element of building socialism now is to rescue the collective life. The final element is to rebuild the culture of struggle. You know, in India, there was a major farmers movement. For a year, the farmers gripped the government, saying that your anti-farmer bills will not be allowed to remain. You want to uberize the peasantry. We are not going to let you. One of the ways, one of the reasons why Comrade Probir and Amit are in jail now is that the government is angry that we wrote about the farmer's struggle. They didn't want us to tell you about the farmer's struggle. They didn't want us to say anything about it. They were embarrassed by it. They keep asking in the interrogations, 
Why did you write about the farmer's struggle? And so on. But that major event of the farmers is only part way in a long journey. When they liberalized agriculture in India in 1991, from 1991 to 2014, 300,000 Indian farmers committed suicide. From 1991 to 2014, 300,000 Indian farmers committed suicide because the conditions of Indian agriculture had deteriorated. But the farmers' unions started a cycle of protests in Maharashtra, in Madhya Pradesh, in Rajasthan, small protests initially, and then major protests, a march from Nasik to Bombay, a long march of 200 kilometers, farmers marching, their feet bleeding because they didn't have shoes. Then they marched in Madhya Pradesh, they marched in Rajasthan. The All India Kisan Sabha, the Farmers Union, Agricultural Workers Union, had to build again a culture of struggle, had to transform a condition of suicide into a condition of battle. The farmers today are not committing suicide like they were because the movements have rebuilt for them the culture of struggle. Comrades, you want to build socialism, you have to rebuild the culture of struggle. You see, part of the journey of building socialism isn't that we don't have the ideas. We have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of ideas of how to build socialism. What we don't have is power. And in order to build power, we have to build the strength of the working class and the peasantry. And that's going to require, in many places, recomposing the class. It's going to require rescuing the collective life. It's going to require building a culture of struggle. You know, people say sometimes, and Claudia said it earlier, people say socialism is utopia. Nothing wrong with utopias. But socialism is really not a utopia. There's enough wealth in the world. There's enough people who understand how to make the world a better place. Socialism is an achievable necessity. It's not a utopia. It's an achievable necessity. We can do it. It's not true. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. It's already happening in our lifetime. They're already building communas in Venezuela. Daniel is, Daniel is always already building pharmacies, opticians, and so on in Recoleta. The Chinese are already building a new rural system. In Kerala, we're already building cooperatives, already building a government that serves the people. Let me give you one little story from Kerala, and then I'm going to wrap up. A few years ago, the government of Kerala was perplexed. Why were girls dropping out of school? So they did a study, and they found that girls were dropping out of school at a certain age from government schools. Then they went and did some qualitative research, and the answer was startling. The moment girls began to menstruate, they were dropping out of school. Why were they dropping out of school when they began to menstruate? Because they couldn't afford sanitary pads. So what did the communist government do in Kerala? free sanitary pads for girls. And suddenly, school attendance improved. Comrades, that might sound like a stupid example, but not for those girls. That's a stupid example, except it's not for those girls. Millions of girls in Kerala are able to finish school, go to college, and then, like Arya Rajendran, become the mayor of Trivandrum. Recently, I was with the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz-Canal. Miguel Diaz Canal is right now running a very difficult, very difficult state, the Cuban state, under immense attack from imperialism, struggling to survive, fighting against all odds. But of course, the Cuban people are resilient and strong. And Miguel Diaz Canal said, revolutionaries must not be pessimistic. Hey, comrades, if the Cuban president can say, revolutionaries must not be pessimistic, we don't dare think like that. We must be optimistic. We must be optimistic. We must study. 
we must struggle we must do things we must fight we must win thanks a lot thank you very much vj just for everybody to notice i know i mentioned it earlier in regards to the china um study but a lot of vj's works books and other tricon material are available near the old fort there's a lot of good material comrades we must study we must read we must struggle um just a reminder that there is a book launch this evening at 18:30 the venue has been changed to this room um the first book that is being launched is our own path to socialism speeches of hugo chavez by carlos ron vj and manolo and the second book is china's revolution and the quest for a socialist future so the book launch will be in this room at 18:30 and a book on Palestine by Daniel we will now take questions and um, due to time we can only take four questions so we'll take four questions or interventions and we just ask the four comrades that would like to have a question or intervention to line up at the mic that is in the center of the room Yes. So uh, thank you, comrades, for all your speeches. They were wonderful. Uh, my name is Pindiga Ambedkar. I am from Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, based in India. My questions are to Comrade Daniel and Tings. Uh, Comrade Daniel, in your speech, you said, for, I mean. Chile was one of the first countries to experience neoliberalism and the left and progressive forces suffered and you mentioned that from 2% now your voting percent for the communist parties has increased to 65 what were the strategies and programs how did you organize i would want to learn and i'm sure everybody would everybody would want to learn that and to things you mentioned that comrades went to the rural areas i mean participated in eradicating poverty but i'm interested that in, in, a, in any society transforming from one stage to another there is some kind of alienation how in the chinese society this alienation is being addressed i would want to learn thank you thank you comrade we'll take the next question we'll have the interventions after the four questions thank you chair Uh, my name is Pushpa Raj Raj Karnika. Uh, in short, Pushpa from Nepal, representing People's Socialist Party. Uh, my question is to Libu Guanza from China. Uh, before before uh, raising my question, I would like to thank her for her presentations. Uh, Libu, you have e explained. the development process of china still i have uh, two questions and the first question is how is status of control over production factors by private bisabi public sector this is one the second question how is train and status of income and the wealth distribution in china thank you Thank you comrade. We'll take the next questions. Boa tarde. Ah, uh, o meu nome é Osumani Camara, secretário-geral de Juventude Africana Mica Cabral, já Juventude do PAIC. Ah, uh, um partido da República de Guiné-Bissau, Partido Libertador da Amilcar Lopes Cabral. I'm part of the the party uh, of Amilcar so Lopes Cabral. Cabral. I'm here to ask not only to the panelists, but also to address the public, this plenary. 
in building socialism today. If all political parties are doing the same over time, that would be to build their own political education school to do the same Nelson Mandela and other fighters, Kwame Nkrumah, Amilcar Cabral, as they did at their time to be able to win this fight. So we're facing a society that is a little bit um, uh, of a coward because youth has not the courage to fight against contemporary capitalism. I want to know what do we do regarding youth to prepare them to face uh, seriously what capitalism is today. Thank you. Comrades, greetings, everyone. Greetings to all comrades from all countries and attending organizations. My name is Ali Jalouli from the Labour Party Tunisia. In fact, I don't have a question, but uh, I have three comments that I am going to read very concisely. The issue that is at stake in this panel cannot be discussed in minutes. Every model of the models that were discussed today deserves further time for discussion. My first comment is about the experience of Chile and Comrade Salvador Allende and the experience of Venezuela with the late Chavez, Comrade Chavez, are experiences that uh, showed the limitations of those same experiences and the limitations of uh, the uh, socialism that did not emanate from a deep socialist revolution. These are um, top-down experiences that had limitations despite the, the advantages that were granted to the great Chilean people and to also the great uh, Venezuelan people, especially during Chavez period. In our analysis, we tend to uh, say or think that these were national liberation experiences more than they were experiences of uh, liberation from uh, imperialism or uh, they are closer to being national liberation than uh, socialist experiences. What my friend Vijay said about the grassroots work in some regions in India is also an experience that needs to be further studied. It's another form of creativity that can happen elsewhere uh, and can other laborers and peasants reproduce in other regions of the world. But anyway, in all, um, in any case, this work, despite its importance, it does not replace a social, a deep social revolution. A last remark is about the experience of China. In fact, this is a, a topic that requires further discussion. I don't believe that China is socialist. And Comrade said that China um, had, has a, a, both a, a socialist and a capitalist uh, model, and it's an issue of divergence between us, and we can, of course, discuss this, and we cannot really claim, make such claims very uh, uh, concisely. China is a major power today, and it is part of the international uh, uh, fight to share the world. In our party, we don't believe that China defends the socialism. Uh, look at what happens in Palestine today. We would like to say that China is the primary partner of the uh, Zionist enterprise. Uh, two days ago, uh, some uh, intellectuals in Palestine uh, made a call to China asking for an intervention to say a few words to at least break 
this imperialist aggression, this French, American, Italian, German, and British imperialism, but we haven't heard any word uh, or any position from China. Uh, so if China were a real socialist state, it should uh, advocate for the national liberation movement in Palestine. We have major divergent opinions, but we believe that uh, the Chinese experience during uh, Mao Zedong, the great leader, had great benefits and had great impacts on the great Chinese uh, people and the great uh, Chinese peasants. Thank you and sorry for being long. Thank you, comrade. Um, we'll now get a few minutes um, for the speakers to then respond to the questions and also give us a closing. Speaking about the, ex the Venezuelan experience, we have said it's a process of construction. We are not even close. We have, uh, we have made important steps. We have made advancements, but we have not we do not claim to we do not claim that venezuelan socialism uh, is complete in venezuela we are under construction and i think that is the challenge of this conference um, what we have done and what are our what advances we have achieved given our history we consider that in the case of our history, we consider that the Bolivarian Revolution was a revolution that uh, changed and transformed a society that was completely considered the model or was going to be the, the second model in our um, region of what neoliberalism brought. So that is what we consider the, the Venezuelan revolution. We also take into account that it is a revolution in the communes that are working in our territory. The popular power that is making in this moment important contributions to change an economy that is dependent on oil. So we do believe that and defend that we defend this uh, model that is uh, good for Venezuela, but other countries and other experiences, I think it's important to get to, to know them. Like the like uh, Comrade said, to study and debate and come to conclusions and solutions that work for all of us. That's it. About Chile, effectively, no one can dispute that the experience of Allende uh, demonstrated the limits, not the political limits, but the, but the limits in terms of power that are needed, uh, the pro that the different processes of constructing socialism require. I reiterate that the, that the government of Allende was not, uh, did not fail when people dispute uh, this fact, people can come to the conclusion that the policies oriented toward the liberation from capitalism uh, by Allende were completely successful. Um, public housing was one of them. Never before had been seen those gains, um, better housing had never seen, been seen. 
Not even in Venezuela. There had never been so many rights in terms of health, in terms of education. The Chilean people had never had access to culture or to the cultural participation more than during the Allende government. Uh, however, we must understand that politics is about power, and given that, when power relations uh, does not give you the majority, uh, popular majority, when Allende was coming to power, there was a majority that was not um, in favor of that process, that began even before Allende. And there was a, there, there is a difference that we have to note in the process of Chavez and the process of Allende. The process of Venezuela goes a step further in terms of a, of a profound um, is, that, is that the work with the military powers is fundamental to a successful revolutionary process. If Venezuela had not, uh, if the military had not been involved in the Venezuelan process, and let's remember that most of Latin American uh, military, the most of them are formed in the U.S. They are formed in their schools. We have a dependence, uh, technical and polit um, political and military, uh, on uh, the U.S. and Israel. They control our borders. Uh, today they are controlled by Israeli companies. So it's, a, it's an issue of power. Lenin always said that all forms of struggle are valid, but they need they need uh, the people, and so we have a great. We need to mobilize the base. So when they ask us why in Recoleta, not only in Chile, uh, in, in the entirety of Chile, the, the Communist Party in Chile, but in Recoleta, we have 65 percent of the vote and two-thirds of the municipal vote. So we have to understand that the pyramid of the con construction of society come from the base, not top down. There is, there is a main theme in the political parties of the world and in all the schools of thought. But it is a sin for the left. For example, for example, uh, China has, has given too much power. There is a criticism that local governments in the left, there is a criticism that the local governments um, are problematic. But in Venezuela, Chavez talks about that, the importance of local governments. So we went in Chile from 2% to 65%, including achieving almost 40% of the uh, district. But we have to prioritize the role of the government that can change the, the life of the people, because we think it is our position that there are two main issues in the, in the social base, uh, the struggle for conscience, as in Engels' book, uh, the society is the conscience of matter, of its power for transformation. There is also the, the issue of the, of the people knowing their productive power. And it's the issue of confidence, of trust. You cannot have, you need the trust of the people. So the peoples of the world today do not trust the, the progressive left movements because the, the left movements have distanced themselves from the people, from the base, because they are, com because they are completely absorbed by the superstructure. So we cannot resolve this with the media, with, the, with social media. 
We resolved this by being in the base. When the minister in, in the... When I, when I grow up, I want to be like the minister, what she said this morning, because she she said something very key. She says, why should the government have a have a stronger position than the, than the people? When historically, revolutions have been made when the base, when the people have power. But when the union, when the unions are not influenced by the left, when the students when the tenants unions, the base contains the power. Since the left is not in the base, because we are too we are too distracted fighting amongst ourselves, so people do not trust us. So if they do not trust us, then they cannot trust in the construction of socialism. Um, th first of all, thank you, comrades, for the questions as well as the comments. I think it's actually very important in a space like this um, with Comrade Ali, uh, the disagreements and the different perspectives on, on the questions such as, as complicated as what is socialism or what is the socialist character. Um, I think on the Palestine question, um, the Chinese government has taken a position and has been pretty consistent in the defense of the creation of a Palestinian state and has echoed this as one of the first countries um, since uh, October 7th rise. And of course, I think as many left and progressive movements, we might imagine or want uh, China to take on a more, uh, more of a uh, role in this international stage. But one of the things I think is in, important is that I think we were seeing in recent moments, China trying to increase its role in the diplomatic stage and trying to be a force of peace, let's say with the recent brokering of relations much needed between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and let's hope that China as, on the, as the state can increase its role on promoting a, a peaceful uh, international solution. I think on the questions around um, how private capital uh, it coexists in a socialist system is one of the biggest challenges today and one of the biggest, let's say, experiments in this phase. Um, the Chinese government in the last few years have been really tackling what has been framed as the disorderly expansion of capital and really trying to see where the excesses of capital uh, have been occurring. And, and some of you might have heard, and unfortunately we won't have more time uh, now, but of course afterwards invite more conversation, on important and large big tech companies such as Alibaba, many of you will know with its CEO Jack Ma, um, and on the eve of its conglomerate, this massive um, organization called Ant Group, it was about to go uh, on the stock exchange uh, in Hong Kong and, and, and Shanghai. And not to go on too much of it, but on the eve of this largest initial public offering uh, in the history of capitalism, the Chinese government stepped in and, and basically paused and upset a huge amount, a large sector of the private capital uh, to look at anti-monopolistic practice or monopolistic practices, to look at areas where the company was acting uh, in, as a financial capacity without actually following the regulations of financial institutions, looking at areas where the company was actually quite predatory against working peoples, uh, thinking about the lending practices in a variety of sectors. And since then, the government has come in and broken up this massive conglomerate into six, uh, six parts, uh, each with different boards, under the supervision of the government, of the state, and has been a very clear example of the state coming in to try to look at what does regulating capital look like at this stage of social development. Uh, we are seeing this in the areas of the privatized sectors of, of education, in the areas of healthcare, in the areas of uh, real estate. Actually, in various sectors of society, there is this question of how to regulate this disorderly, the excesses of capital that still coexist today into, in the socialist system. And I think there was a question about the alienation. And, and I think, um, I'll talk about one experience that I found really touching in going to uh, the countryside and talking to about these experiences. Because a small part, about 10% of the people who were uh, lifted out of extreme poverty in this recent 10 years had to actually be relocated to areas, um, new communities that were built, uh, usually in smaller scale cities or in districts or counties. 
And this actually was a very difficult transition. Imagine, especially for elders, you've lived your whole life. Uh, your, your subjectivity is that of a peasant. Your identity, your class position is of a peasant. And now you move into a, 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 a small city even. Uh, you live in a, a building uh, where there are elevators. And we talked to some of the party members there organizing, and they actually get the youth to become adoptive grandchildren, especially for the elders. And they do these programs called the Six First. It's to actually walk hand in hand for the first time someone rides an elevator. The first time you see a zebra crossing, you know, you see a, a light, you've never seen a, a light before, you don't know how to cross the street. Uh, the first time you go to a supermarket, you know, pay with a phone. China is almost virtually a cashless society. The first time you go to sightsee, to go to do a tourism activity for leisure. These are some of the things to address this real question, real difficult questions of how you enter a modernization period, and it's very difficult. It's filled with lots of also resistance, I think, from the people. And one thing that I saw, at least in this community, which had about 18,000 households um, relocated uh, from, from various uh, from communities, there was actually one family, in the end, a couple, that only one couple in the whole of 18,000 that decided that they wanted to return home. So this also says sometimes there's an idea that this is very coercive. You're forced to move, you're forced to do, but no, you have to convince the people and bring the people along with the process. But there was one couple, both of them have disabilities and couldn't adjust to the life uh, in the city and they decided to move home where they did subsistence farming and maintain that. But I think that says something about addressing these questions of alienation and these very careful, actually, subtle ways that take in the human process. Um, but I, I will invite anyone later on to have more conversations. There's also other comrades here from China to, to open debates and discussions. So thank you, comrades. <clears throat> well, um, ever, ever since the October Revolution of 1917, all socialist revolutions have taken place in poor countries, whether it's Mongolia, 1917, Vietnam, 1945, Cuba, 1959, China, 1949, all poor countries had socialist revolutions. Europe failed us. The German revolution was crushed. There was no revolution in the United States. The British, for God's sake, Chris, what is wrong with the British? Where was their revolution? When poor countries have to build socialism, they have two principal simultaneous tasks. To establish national sovereignty, to protect themselves from imperialist attack, and to build the productive forces. And from the first experiment in the Soviet Union, to build the productive forces meant a lot of experimentation, including the new economic policy. So I've always thought of socialism not as a test, is it socialist or not, but as a process, as a journey, filled with experimentation and class struggle. Because even after the revolution, class struggle continues. It's not like in China, 1949, class struggle ended. In fact, class struggle continues in China now. It's still a class struggle. The class struggle continues, experimentation continues, the development of the productive forces for a poor country continues. So I always feel, let's look at these experiments and try to understand the best of them and try to see what can be learned, how we can learn in other countries, poor countries, which have a breakthrough into the possibility of socialism. If the class comes to dominate the state, it still has to struggle with a poor society with a society not fully socialist in culture and character. And that takes a long time, which is why socialism is wise and it needs to breathe. You know, comrade, when you asked about youth and political education, next year is the 100th anniversary of the death of Lenin. For that, Leftward Books is publishing a new edition of what is to be done. I was reading this book again for the hundredth time. It's a fantastic book. In the middle of the book, Lenin talks about discipline. And when I was reading it this time, I thought, my God, 
how often in our movements we misunderstand what lenin is saying because sometimes in our movements when we're training young people we assume that discipline means obedience obey us obey the teacher obey the party obey the line but in fact what lenin is saying is build the political consciousness of the cadre discipline means a highly conscious cadre who understands the world who in fact can become your teacher we are not in, in a sense building enough cadre in our movements we're not putting enough into political education so i quite agree with you that focusing on political education is a key aspect of our work but it's not political education in what paulo freire called a nutrition sense you don't just put spoonfuls of medicine into people's mouth but you make them a conscious leader every cadre is a leader that's what lenin meant by discipline every cadre is a leader thank you very much comrades and thank you to each and every one of you for staying here throughout the afternoon we'll now have the book lunch at 18:30 and dinner at the hotel and this evening don't forget to come back and have fun in the old fort area <laughs> <laughs>